All right, it's time for Deploy on Friday, the internet audio slash video talk show featuring myself and Jim. Uh, Jim Pelletier, John Bristow, both at Octopus Deploy. Uh, thank you for joining us for episode one, the inaugural episode of Deploy on Friday. How are you, Jim? Down in sunny slash rainy Melbourne, Australia? How are things down there? It is out of control down here. I don't know if you can actually hear it, but the rain is pounding on my roof right now. It is... 15 degrees in the middle of February, uh, which is the middle of summer in Australia. So, yeah, not love and life at the moment, to be honest, weather-wise. Okay. Well, I'll happily trade you because I'm here <laughs> in Queensland, uh, just south of Brisbane, where I am. It is absolutely putrid. It is humid. It is hot. I do not like it. My Canadian body does not know how to handle this weather. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so Deploy on Friday is a show that um, basically takes the summary of the news and events that occurred during the last week. Uh, we try and kind of package that up into an hour-long show, talk a little bit about some of the things that interest us, uh, share with you some news about Octopus Deploy, that sort of thing. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. I will switch over using the magic of software and hopefully hardware. So um, first up, we have a new website. So for those folks who haven't made this their bookmark or a homepage on their browser, please feel free to do so, octopus.com. We have a new website that's been redesigned. I don't know about you, Jim, but I actually do like the new design quite a lot. It's pretty slick. What do you think? It is very slick. I know talking to a couple of the, uh, the team who are working on this and they were super proud of those animations and, and all the, the cool bits of it. But uh, yeah, the content's amazing as well. Fantastic. And we have some other subsites related to this. We have one for GitHub. We have one for Astro as well, which was actually, or sorry, one for DevOps, which was built in Astro 2.0, which we'll talk about in this uh, session of Deploy on Friday. But uh, yeah, if you haven't had a chance to take a look, feel free to do so. We also have a roadmap, which is uh, launched. This is using Product Board, a very popular planning tool for features and product requests. You can submit ideas here if you're at all interested. Here's what we've shipped. Uh, not not a bad list of uh, features, I would say. Jim, have you worked on any of the products that are listed here? None of the products are listed here. I think, uh, yeah, we're just spinning up a, a new big exciting feature that maybe we can talk about a little bit later in the year. Uh, but none of these ones, no. All right. So, yeah, we uh, we shipped a whole bunch of things. Um, I was lucky enough to be on the team that shipped our GitHub Actions, uh, our new CLI, which is based on Go. Uh, loosely associated with the team that worked on the ITSM stuff. I'm not trying to do a humble brag or anything, but you know we did a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah, great to see all the features that are listed there. So again, if you want to check this out, it's at roadmap.octopus.com, along with our new website. Um, yeah, nice new digs. I actually like it quite a bit. It's it's really good to see us get our uh, design mojo going. I like it. I think it's awesome. Just just uh, you know how much we're sharing with everyone what we're working on and and what we want to do. Yeah, fantastic. All right, on to the other news. Uh, hey, congratulations to GitHub. 100,000, 100, 100 million developers <laughs> and counting. Uh, this is bonkers. Jim, when did you join GitHub? What year? Do you remember? Um, I do not remember what year. I'd hesitate to say it would have been pretty early on. I was thinking, as I read this article and saw the 100 million, I'm like, I remember when GitHub didn't exist. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> And uh, and and for those who don't, it, I trust you. It was they were dark times. It was yep. very very difficult. Different, oh, I know. Different different landscape for sure. Yep. I think I joined GitHub back in 2007, and mm. uh, my my activity graphs were quite light. They were very white and uh, not a lot of green going on. I am happy to say, or proud to say, that last year was by far my most uh, active year. I think I had over 1,500 contributions, code reviews, code submits, um, PRs, blah, 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 blah. So very, very busy. And I think my entire commit uh, or contribution uh, contrib contribution sort of graph was completely green. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the things that I've always been a little bit jealous of. You know, sometimes you work inside places that don't use GitHub. Uh, and you sort of <laughs> see everyone else's contribution graph, and you know, oh. yeah. So, 100 million developers, uh, that's fantastic. So, well done, GitHub. Uh, here's to the next 100 million, I guess. And uh, it's amazing to me, like, just as a slight tangent, you know, to see kind of like what's happening with GitHub. Um, they, as you know, report along with other sites like Stack Overflow and the state of JavaScript and all these other sites, report constantly on what they're seeing. 
interestingly enough, fun little fact, the number one or the fastest programming language um, in GitHub right now, HCL. So the HashiCorp HCL. configuration language is the number one fastest growing. Now, that may be like from zero, it doesn't, you can easily get yeah. to a million percent percent increase. But um, that one I found really interesting. So a lot of folks are using config as code, using technologies like Terraform uh, to stand up infrastructure. And HCL is one of the fastest growing languages on in GitHub. So. Yeah, growth is always a really interesting metric. I'd be really yes. interested to find out, like, <laughs> and I don't know how I don't know how they they get this metric, but like, because things like Pulumi, right, that are coming along, and, and the ones yeah. that are, are challenging uh, HashiCorp and, and Terraform now. I mean, that that's any language, right? So you mm. can't even pull you can't even pull that metric with a with a language stat. Mm. Mm. So yeah, that's awesome news. Well done to GitHub and Co. This is a little article that I th I thought was kind of interesting and uh, kind of aligns to what I do. And uh, I'll explain the gist of this. It's The title is, You Should Take More Screenshots. The idea here is that, um, well, this is a bit of a philosophy I've had in, for a long time, which is, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but a demo is worth a thousand pictures. So take more screenshots is sort of the, the mantra here. And the reason why is because as you work with uh, software applications, you build them out. Oftentimes, when there's a bit of a disconnect that you'll go through if you're um, just writing down what you're capturing. So if you write down the gist of what it is rather than take a screenshot, sometimes it can be a bit confusing. Like, what did I write? Why did I write this? What am I writing about, etc. And so what Alex was recommending in his blog post was that, you know, you should really actually take a lot of screenshots. Everyone has a key binding that maps to a screenshot utility and disk space is you know, a dime a dozen now, it's like, you know, come on, what are we talking about? We got Google Drive, we got Dropbox. I mean, there's no excuse. So um, screenshots are really good because they're very semantically wait, weightful. They're date stamped. Uh, they've got a lot of context there. So um, the gist of this article is basically, hey, take screenshots. What do you think about this idea? I love it. I love it. I was I was equally excited and triggered by this uh, article. I'll, <laughs> I'll get to the triggering a bit later. But yeah, this is something that... Um, we in, in the team I'm working on at the moment, we're trying to use a lot more. We're working on a project that um, has heaps of interest across the company. Everyone sort of wants to know what's going on with it, where we're up to. So, yep. um, you know, in the world of Slack, taking a screenshot and posting that about something significant that happened today. It doesn't, you know, it can be, it doesn't need to be a polished demo. It can be, you know, a snippet of code. It can be yep. an error screen is sometimes really interesting as well. Um, but sharing something visual, you're right. It just it's it says a thousand words. Mm. Um, mm. So there where you it go. triggered me is when I started thinking about the, the article talks about um, sort of using them to to look back on your own past. And I always find when I think about that, it's it's the finding and searching them and and, and just <laughs> set right. me down that whole you know the OCD uh, tendency we can tend to have of trying to organize and catalog catalog, catalog and 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 make everything findable and it just never works. I'm just yeah yeah. Well. <laughs> well, you know what? I mean, I have to, and like not to get off on a tangent here, but um, operating systems like macOS and Windows are doing a really good job of being able to tell you what's in certain images now. So I don't know if you've mm. used the Photos app on a, on a Mac, but it it can identify faces. I mean, I, I, I could easily see, obviously, with the trend moving towards, you know, AI, et cetera, with all the hotness that's going on there, uh, why you couldn't be able to reconcile a search and qualify what you're looking for. I mean, you got to be able to describe right. it, but once you have, you should be all right. It's only going to get better, right? Like, take the screenshots mm -hmm. now, work it out later. Yep. <laughs> awesome. So HP Pi is a little utility that I've used in the past. If you've used anything like Postman or you use like a proxy trace like Fiddler or Wireshark, you know, being able to see what's on the wire turns out to be pretty important. It helps you to diagnose what what sort of uh, bits are being transmitted, especially when you're creating a connected app. And um, I thought this was kind of interesting. So again, in, in the world of AI and language models, et cetera, um, one of the trends that I'm seeing, I don't know if you have, Jim, but I've seen that um, CLIs, utilities are all adopting this sort of natural language interface uh, for interacting with applications. And so what HP AI uh, is looking to do is provide you a, a, a way to interact with APIs through sort of a, a natural language. Um, so they provided this mechanism of just tell me the news, not the weather. Um, do as I mean, not what I say type interface. And through this assistant, they'll cook up these HP requests for you. What do you think about this? 
I I was kind of blown away when I saw this for the first time, and it's it's a little it took me a little moment to realize what it actually was because it's a private beta and, and I couldn't yeah. download it and have a play with it. Um, but it seems amazingly powerful on the surface, and the, the only the only other thought I had about it is I'm I really like to see it in my hands because I just <laughs> want to know are we truly moving up another layer of abstraction here? Like are we abstracting away details we don't know? Or are we losing familiarity with details we need to know? Um, I would I say it's all it's, of the above. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is probably the age-old question, right? Like, why aren't we coding in assembly? But um, right. Yeah. <laughs> really, I'm really interested to get my hands on this and and see see where it falls on that spectrum for sure. Fantastic. Um, another thing that hit this week, Astro 2.0. Uh, for those who don't know, Astro is a very popular, well, increasingly popular web framework. Um, it's super, super fast. Um, it's right up there with some of the other static generation sites that are out there. The thing that I love about this is that it's a, it's, it's a combination of what most people will use when building out these sort of websites, which are markdown, markup, static typing, uh, auto generation of types. And so what Astro provides is basically um, a new way to approach these problems um, while being super duper fast. So you can leverage your, your UI frameworks of choice like React, Svelte, or Vue, and then what will happen is if you combine that with something like Markdown, it will generate for you types that you can utilize in TypeScript, for example, when referencing those in your backend programming. So Astro is a sort of a new approach towards this idea of, hey, I've got content in a format that can be easily grokked, and then I want you to generate for me the tooling along for the ride, and then I want to use that as part of the, the generation process. So um, Astro 2.0 shipped this week, and um, this is probably one of the hottest web frameworks I've seen out there. Have you heard of this one? No, I have to say I came to this one pretty ignorant. Um, so okay. it's interesting what you're describing there. Sounds amazing, though. It reminds me a lot of uh, F Sharp type providers, which do a similar thing. They'll scrape a, a you know a, a, an SQL schema or something and give you back a strongly typed um, types you know types to to program against. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So the, the thing that they keep pushing is this notion of what's called hybrid rendering. So static meeting dynamic. So the idea is that mm. static websites have been generated. And the reason why they're used a lot is because they're super duper fast. There's no yeah. real heavy lifting going on in the back end. So you can be super scalable. But this allows you to have some a, a, a similar notion around dynamic build output uh, from the server. And so you can actually combine the, the two worlds together. So you get strong typing generated via markdown that you can utilize within types in typescript and then utilize that as part of generating your site design so astro is is a new sort of approach to this um it has been around for for a bit but it's starting to pick up a lot of steam in astro 2.0 and as i said earlier has just shipped so definitely worth checking out yeah right does it so if you were to ship some new markdown that would be a redeploy so that it could generate the types generate the static uh gener and then deploy the site Generally, yes. And yeah, the way yeah. that that's done is through the tooling that's there. So yeah, it's right. a NPM install sort of process away you go. Yeah, amazing. Yep. Speaking of releases, uh, we have a new version of Go, the runtime. So Go 120 is now available. Uh, we were on our team using 119 for the new CLI we have at Octopus. But Go is um, one of those languages that could. I'm a real fan of Go. I started programming it about two years ago. And uh, we used it to build the Terraform provider. We used it to build the CLI. Uh, we used it to use the API client for Octopus. And now 1.20 is released. Um, most of the releases you see around Go these days are most uh, more around the the sort of functional language. Uh, sorry, the um, the functional frameworks that are around it. The the sort of the libraries that support uh, what you want to do in Go and the tooling. So the tooling, the the compilers, which does a heck of a lot of heavy lifting. That's where you're seeing a lot of the improvement occurring right now. Um, language innovations don't tend to be all that uh, frequent now because they don't tend to be very backwards compatible. And so um, you're not seeing a lot of innovation being done in that space, but that's fine. Most people are really happy with the language. Now, obviously we're on the road to 2.0 and they're introducing concepts like enums and other things. There was some debate as when, when they added generics earlier, whether they would have to jump to 2.0. It turns out they can get full backwards compatibility with generics in, included. So. That was really a, a nice, pleasant surprise. So we've been using Go uh, internally at Octopus for a long time now, and uh, we feel really performant 
uh, when when cutting Go code. There's a lot of, you know, it's it's kind of like a combination of C sharp plus Ruby, like a lot of dry principles and uh, being able to use stuff that's really well tested and battle tested. But the big one for us, and this is why we chose to use Go for the CLI, it's super multi platform. Like this thing can run anywhere. Like we can compile to 27 different platforms off of one tool set, and away you go. Like we're compiling for ARM x64. M1 Max, M2 Max now. Um, I, you know, we've got an ARM build that can run on, you know, Raspberry Pi. You know, so it's just crazy the uh, the tooling that's there. And of course, that pays homage to the the compilers that are uh, that have come before around C and C plus plus. But uh, I don't know. I'm I'm pretty excited with you know the future for Go. Uh, I think it's going to give you know Rust uh, a run for its money in terms of the coolness factor. But uh, you know, it's always one of those two. It's either Rust or Go. Which one's cooler? Have, have mm -hmm. you done any work with uh, Go yet? I haven't. <clears throat> and that probably shapes my opinion of it. I, I like okay. languages. I like <laughs> languages with lots of language features. Like yep. um, the fact that there was a, a the fact that there was controversy over introducing generics in Go. I think um, pretty much settled which camp I fall in when it comes to those two. But um, but I haven't used the tooling in anger. I haven't had a need to do multi platform <laughs> targeting like you guys okay. have. I do yep. appreciate the 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 um the deployment story right single executable right. just just copy it somewhere that's amazing yeah yeah yep yep we should so uh, the, uh we should we should have a look at uh what is it b flat uh, when we get a chance <laughs> next time next week maybe that's right yeah we, i've mm. talked about b flat before it's an interesting sort of approach as well um mm. and i they're using roslyn quite a bit for for a lot of their comp mm. compilation is that right yeah yeah it looks like they've sort of uh forked Fork some part of Roslyn and then built some tooling around it to essentially give you a similar build and deployment experience to go on C sharp. Fantastic, yeah. 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 So um, the the big win that you get with with Rust over Go right now is the 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 actual binaries themselves. They're super small and they're yeah. really really fast. Um, that's the the perf the the punch up that's going on between Go and Rust is interesting. It's more around the performance. Um, crate sizes though in in Rust are super small, and but you it takes you kicking and screaming into a statically typed world. If you don't like static types, you're gonna hate Rust. I mean, it's everything is is typed there. Um, goes mm -hmm. a little bit more flexible there. We've got things like interface types, and we've got generics, and it you can be a little bit. It is still strongly typed on that level, but when you start mm -hmm. moving to interfaces and stuff, it gets a little bit more fast and loose. But I think yeah, it's yeah. it's got a nice sweet spot there. So that's cool. 120. Um, this was a cool little utility that I saw earlier. This is um, called Git Sim. And uh, I don't know about you, Jim, but oftentimes whenever I cherry pick or fork or branch or anything like that, the nightmare scenario, like if I don't have Git Kraken or something other to visualize my branch, uh, I'm screwed. I don't know about you. Um, so oh. Git Sim is a little utility that allows you to visualize uh, or re. re reissue um in a, in a simulated environment get operations that you conduct on your repos so the idea here is that you can run this little utility it's sort of like a dry run and they talk about when dry run isn't enough but they talk about how it works underneath the covers and so by using this utility what it allows you to do is get a general visualization of what actually is occurring on your repo as you're conducting operations like if i reset for head or if i cherry pick or if i fork it will visually show you what actually occurred as part of the output. Yeah, no, I saw this and this is chef kiss. Um, <laughs> you know, this is this is one of the classic tweets you see, uh, you know, I'm a senior developer and still every day I Google these oh, commands, God, yeah. you know? Yep. Um, yeah. And the thing I find about, about Git too is like the times... The times that you're most unsure about what you're doing are the times when you're in the biggest trouble in the first place. So it's sort of like <laughs> I'm, all, <laughs> I'm already sweating, and now I need to yep. do something really complex and, and get it right as well. Yep. Um, yep. So a tool like this, just yeah. yeah. Yep. I have that moment of Han Solo looking around at the Millennium Falcon, being like, "Come on, baby, hold together. Don't fall <laughs> yeah, yeah, apart yeah, on yeah. me yet." So all right, good. I'm not alone. Yeah. So get sim, uh, check it out, use it, know it, love it, etc. Our friends over at JetBrains have been publishing a whole bunch of articles regarding the state of the developer ecosystem. They've been doing this for about six years now. And more recently, they published an update for their ecosystem survey for 2022 slash 2023. 
And uh, this is the blog post that talks about it. It obviously links through to the uh, report itself. Some of the findings obviously aren't that big of a surprise. JavaScript is popular. Who, who would have thought TypeScript is becoming very popular? Technologies that developers find promising, AI, ML, et cetera, Rust, JavaScript, Go, Kotlin, et cetera. Um, then there's always this one. Um, I don't use it at work, but I would love it if I could. Um, so Go, Rust, Kotlin, et cetera. Um, so it's it's a summary, and it's similar to what you see coming out of folks from Stack Overflow, et cetera, around what's what's popular, what isn't, uh, what what folks are wanting to use, what what they can't use, what they would like to use, et cetera. And so there's definitely some some good insights there. I think the reason why these things are incredibly popular is because, you know, a lot of us in the developer space suffer from imposter syndrome. Please tell me I'm doing it like everyone else. <laughs> Please don't tell me I'm alone. And also, you know, uh, when they're looking for, you know, new work or new jobs or roles, et cetera, um, following the latest trends also helps. 100%. Yep. The thing that I sure. think uh, I was most excited to see out of this one was the the fifty percent of developers are, um, are remotely co programming. Oh, okay. Regularly or something like that, yep. because I am waiting with 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 uh, bated breath when JetBrains releases uh, Live Share for write up. So <laughs> just, thought I, just thought I'd get that one in there in case anyone's okay. listening. <laughs> okay. So you're a writer fan, are you? We use Rider. I use Rider a lot. Uh, I developed C Sharp on a Mac. We've got a reasonably large C Sharp solution. Um, I don't find Visual Studio Code really scales to large scale C Sharp development very well. The refactoring mm. tools aren't there. Um, yeah. Sometimes it chokes on just you know, yeah, yeah. building up its indexing of the types and stuff like that. So Rider does a lot better job. Rider's great at that. But mm. when I want to pair program, when I want to mob, when I want to mentor, um, live sharing would really be a tool that would be great. Yeah. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. They, they provide a lot of great IDE experiences and tooling and such. And obviously they've got tools 100%. like, you know, team city and all, so they know their stuff. And so yeah, um, yeah. you're all interested. Definitely worth checking out that article there. This was a tweet that uh, kind of caught my attention. Obviously we I've been spending a lot of time looking at things like GPT. Um, I've been talking about GPT with friends for months now, and then Chat GPT came out, and then that's when the whole world just exploded. And like, oh, have you heard of Ch you know Chat GPT? It's the greatest thing. Um, so what this is is um, Paul Buchheit. I, I don't know if I've got his name right. I apologize, Paul, if I butchered your name. He was one of the um, original engineers that uh, worked on uh, Gmail, and he was one of the early engineers at Google, and he was saying that. Uh, this was a tweet, tweet that he put out that Google may be only a year or two away from total disruption. Now, that's a bit of a hyperbolic sort of uh, statement, I guess. But um, his assertion is that AI will eliminate the search result page. What do you what do you think about that? What's your gut feeling I, on that one? I mean, I, I, on the face of it, it looked like a really hyperbolic statement too, right? Um, but yeah. I had a bit more of a read, a bit more of a dig. Like, so, so he also worked on AdSense, the initial version of AdSense. So... I think he does have some insight into how AI and machine learning gets applied to these kind of things. And then he also goes into detail a bit more about it later. And he's not to mm -hmm. say that there isn't a need to index the content on the web, but maybe right. you don't need to use keyword search to get to it. And that AI may provide, much like we were talking about before with um with HTTP Pi, right? So right. AI might be the new search interface over the layer where the web is still indexed as text. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And plus, there's all that gamification that goes on with keywords anyway. I mean, people are yeah, it's just, exactly. a race to, yeah, yeah. just a race to the bottom in terms of who wants to buy what keyword. And, you know, oh, our, great. Our competitors bought keywords that, that are directly related to us. Like things like that. You can tell it's like a bit corrupt. So, yeah, um, totally. Yeah. Not to yeah. say that language model would be any better, but, you know, if it treats everything kind of like, hey, we don't care what's in there, we just basically create one and then you can query it. Obviously, I don't know if you've had a chance to play with ChatGPT yet. I have. I, I, I find it kind of interesting. Um, but obviously, people say that for a variety of reasons, it's not the most accurate of uh, solutions out there. But it can only get better. I mean, GPT-4 is just around the corner, and it's got a huge set compared to GPT-3.5. Yeah, and this is one of the things that I don't understand about GPT as a technology itself. And I wonder if you do things. You said you looked at it a bit more. And I was actually yep. wondering this more... I was wondering about this more when I was thinking about HTTP Pi because HTTP Pi 
to work well, we'll have to have built a language model over HTTP to understand it or Swagger or however it's scraping that information. And I just wasn't sure it's like, is because I understand how ChatGPT can, can build models over natural language, but is it a versatile enough model that it can actually build over non-natural language like machine language or HTTP or code? I mean, Copilot seems to do a really good job with code. So maybe it can. Yeah, it is generating code for a lot of folks. So yeah. it can generate it can generate functions. It can it can process. This is part of the reason why it's very powerful is because it is generating mm. code. Now I can't say I can't assert for certain whether or not it's the best code that's out there. The examples I've seen, there are some laughable examples where people have said yeah. given it given it code examples and like this is clearly not the way. Um, some people have also given it logic puzzles and it's failed abysmally, but yeah, I've seen um, that. Yeah. Yeah. Given, given the, given the size and where we're at, and given the fact that this is a V1, not even a V1, like a pre you know, like a beta, uh, and just knowing how quickly these things can evolve. I think that's where people start to see the potential. And so, yes, I think there will be people who kind of say, oh, you know, rub, you know, point and laugh, look at him, look at him and laugh. Uh, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, I think, I think this kind of shows the potential. My, my initial impression with chat GPT when I first saw it was, okay, I was clearly wrong about AI. Cause I had poo pooed AI for a long time, generalized AI. I'm like, we are so far from there. Um, but when I saw something like this, I was like, oh, okay, this is strong. This is actually pretty good. And this might be enough. And then you start to realize actually we're this is just early days and we're going to get better and better and get stronger so yeah definitely early days yeah. and definitely interesting it's a it's definitely a level change um mm. but uh, then again we also do see it's all still specific still language based yeah. stuff it's interesting yeah. Yeah. yeah super interesting all right cool more innovation i mean it's like just it's like christmas you know all these innovations that are coming out so <laughs> TypeScript 5.0 beta. Um, I, I read through this. I was actually quite encouraged. We did a TypeScript library for our API at Octopus. Uh, we shipped it last year, an API client in TypeScript. We use it for our GitHub Actions. Uh, we use it for a new version of the ADO, uh, Azure DevOps integration, that we'll be shipping out very soon. Uh, TypeScript 5 adds a feature called decorators. Uh, this one is the one that's getting the most hype. The idea with decorators is that um, this is an upcoming ECMAScript feature that allows you to decorate classes and members. And uh, anyone who's done anything with attributes in there in C Sharp, Java, et cetera, name a language that you, you know, you've done attribute, uh, it will allow you to basically add or annotate um, code inside of, say, a method. So in this example here, to an annotation here, I can simply say this is a logged method. And rather than just emitting a single, this is the canonical example that everyone kind of points to with. AOP and things like that. It's like, oh, I can add, I can inject log statements. It's like, okay, fair enough, you know. But with annotations, um, you'll be able to do other additional uh, work. Obviously, it can be a bit of a nightmare in terms of debugging with a complex data set. But uh, it is interesting to see that this is the direction they're moving to. Uh, some some limitations I read about this is that it doesn't support metadata at the moment, so it's just very bare. It's very primitive at the moment. But it is interesting to see. The direction that the language is moving in and i would be interested to see like you know they're eventually going to get to a point where the venn diagram with with javascript doesn't cross over and they're like all right we got to do some really fancy trickery to make this work in javascript like that's where the heavy lifting is I, the compiler team in in the typescript land is really is really the team that gets the young sung hero award i think but um well, yeah hopefully WebAssembly will be around by then perhaps <laughs> that's right <laughs> Yeah, the, the the decorator one's definitely one that surprised me a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, those kind of that kind of AOP stuff can be super powerful and get you out of a bind, uh, but also mm. with great power, right? Yes. The ones that I was really excited about in here were uh, all enums are union enums. Oh yes. Uh, yeah, that was a really cool one, um, and it sort of makes me wonder. It sort of makes me wonder though, because you could do this already, and I don't know why. You wouldn't just use a, a union instead of an enum. Now you don't have mm. enums like they used to be anymore. But I, I love using this kind of union type um, typing in my code to really make it correct. And the one I was disappointed about in here is the one that says exhaustive switch case completions. Oh, no. Because I thought that was going to be exhaustive switch case 
Oh, uh, compile errors. Yes. Um, there you, is you a missed sip- this case. You missed this in this case. Exactly. Example. Yeah. 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 To make sure your switch case is exhaustive. Um, Wouldn't the linter a- help there? Maybe I don't know. I mean, like you, you can do it with never types. Like- you can yeah. you can put in you can put an assignment of a never type to a variable in your um, fall through default case, but you have to right. remember okay. to do it. Right. Yep. Um, so it's not like you can turn on a strict mode that makes sure um, that that they're exhaustive or something. There's a a friend of mine in Melbourne, Bazarat, who's written some great books on JavaScript and TypeScript. Yes. Um, He's doing, page, his YouTube channel is blowing up right now. Yeah, He's totally. A lot of videos. Yeah. One of the first things he did was a GitHub book, and it's got the code, the, the specific thing on how to do that exhaustive um, switch, and it is one of my most searched Googles. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, we all we we have those. We have all our. We know where our own bodies are buried when it comes to programming. Like, oh, what was that thing again? And then yeah, you yeah, see yeah. it in your history, and you're like, oh, good. I've looked at this <laughs> before. Fantastic. <laughs> cool. So yeah, TypeScript five o beta. Um, as a point of reference, um, if you haven't downloaded and installed, if you're using VS Code, there's an extension that I like, which is the nightly. Uh, it's the TypeScript nightlies. Uh, extension and will automatically grab and install um, the latest bits for you. So it makes it a seamless experience when wanting to test out features like this. So definitely worth checking out. Awesome. Uh, Moving right along. You will never be, you, Jim, this was for you. You, (laughs) Jim, will never be a full stack developer or career advice for the working web dev. What do you think about this? I was wondering what you're trying to say when I read that in the wrong <laughs> So this is dated 2020. Uh, just a little bit of context there. So uh, this came out a couple of years ago, obviously. Um, but I think that there are people who still believe that this is possibly the case. It's interesting because you get a range of di- you get a diverse range of opinions when it comes to full stack. There are people who just live and breathe it and say, no, you should be a full stack developer. There are others who are like, no, 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 no. You got to focus on stick. Stay in your lane. Stick to what you know. Don't worry about writing T SQL. Whatever. I don't know. I'm just you know. What do you what What are your thoughts on this? I love thinking in in the full stack. I love being across the full stack to the yep. point where when I think full stack, I actually think full stack a little a little wider than a web developer. To be honest, um, <laughs> not that I'm great at the lower heart, lower part of those yeah. stacks, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really enjoy working at the full stack, but that does mean that I there are skills that I really can't have that I need to lean on other people in my team to do. So, you know, this is where, um, you know, broken comb shaped or T-shaped teams are really important as well, Mm -hmm. right? You need generalists, you need specialists, um, you need all of that. So, yeah. I love the, uh, I love the source down here. I'm just making this up. This is totally subjective. There is no data. (laughs) I I love that. And, and the graph's amazing too. I think it's a really cool representation of what's going on. And you could almost you could almost take the um, the legend off it, and it still makes a lot of sense, right? Oh yeah, it's just, yeah, 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 yeah. So, anyways, there are there are folks out there uh, who firmly believe this, um, and there are even frameworks that push you, you know, uh, kicking and screaming in this idea. Like, for example, TRPC, which is a, t- a TypeScript based RPC framework that uses um, another framework called Zod for um, for uh, Val- it's a validation framework, etc., and um, it's it's fantastic. But it definitely takes you in this direction of, hey, um, you are a full stack developer. You need to work in this mode. Uh, you own o- both ends of the pipe. Um, operate in this way, <laughs> full stack or yeah. die. I mean, whatever way you yeah. want to classify it. So um, this is something that hit my radar and is actually getting really, really popular as well. So. Uh, I didn't have this in our show notes, but this is obviously aligned to what we were just discussing. Yeah, totally. And I think, I mean, this is something that I've, it's not necessarily that I just, I, I want everyone to be full stack or have a, a view that being full stack is super important. I think it's great. Yep. TypeScript on the front and the back end though, mm. and the safety that gives you, um, I think is amazing. And those are the kind of frameworks that then push you to work full stack as well, right? Because it's the same code yeah. base full stack. Yeah. 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 I gotcha. Mm. All right. Uh, 
a couple other articles just wanted to wrap up on. So um, this one was uh, by the folks over at Rail Rail Yard Railway, excuse me. They they produce a product similar to in some ways to a deployment tool that we have at Octopus. Um, but I thought this article was pretty good. Why we ship the most code on Friday? So um, they they're espousing the fact that you should have faith in your pipelines and in your in your workflows, and that shipping on Friday shouldn't be a big deal. Now. Obviously, some of these incidents uh, rates uh, don't really align up in your the kind of uh, the red flag goes off a little bit when you see things like this. So, for example, Saturday may only have nine, but that's because no one's in the office on Saturday and you're not getting a lot of reported <laughs> errors. You know, I noticed uh, Sunday but had these... 13 as well. Correct. <laughs> hey, you the sum, you're starting to get right up there. And even in Monday, maybe those are ones that people are discovering because you shipped on Friday. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I think that there is validity to the argument of, you know, simply like like our show, Deploy on Friday, Ship on Friday should have a similar philosophy, which is, hey, why not? You know, like you should have faith in your pipelines. You should have faith in your deployment processes. Otherwise, what are we doing here? Like, why are we shipping? What's the difference between shipping on Friday versus Tuesday? If you don't, if you don't have faith in your deployment processes, you're going to have problems. So, yeah, hundred percent. I, I love, love I love that. Go on. I was just going to say, I love the cobra emoji. Always got to have a, <laughs> a snake emoji. Go ahead, snake. Um, I was just going to say, I, I love, I love the message on this one too, and I liked how there was a section when they when they spent some time talking about what we're really talking about here is like. Not only do you want to have faith in your in your deployment pipeline, but you want to shift your feedback far left as you can. So I'm going left right. off screen, you know. Um, so early linting, uh, you know, early type checking. They they sort of list all the things they use to help make their um, deployments more reliable, and it's it's all about fast feedback, which is what you need. Love it. And wrapping right up, uh, this is from the Chrome advocacy uh, team, the, the DevRel team. Uh, this is at web.dev. Uh, this is a website that I frequent every now and then. And they talk a little bit about in this article about, um, it's a good article um, to kick off the year, basically saying in 2023, um, the continuing trend around the web is interoperability. And so even though a lot of us have been in this space for years, some of us decades, and we've seen the interoperability story, uh, espoused again and again, there are still some edge cases that we have to tackle. And so when they when they talk about, you know, what would those edge cases be? What do they look like? There are still some things that we have to agree on across, across vendors. So, you know, some of the examples you may have experienced yourself. And so they talk a little bit about it in this article of some of the things that uh, that need to happen. Now, the good news here is that we have had technologies that have stepped in and, you know, like spackling on a wall filled in the cracks to try and provide some interoperability. But Ideally, what we want are the browser vendors to step up and implement these things properly. But um, yeah, I think that, you know, going ahead, if you're building for the web, um, there's still going to be some edge cases that may not align. Thankfully, we have tools like Can I Use and others that will give you some insight as to what you can do. And there's also frameworks that you can use. Um, you know, you can still use jQuery if you feel so compelled. I mean, it does give you a little bit of that if you want. So, uh, but there are other ones as well. Definitely still around the old jQuery. Yes, that's right. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, that is a wrap up of our first and hopefully many uh, episodes of Deploy on Friday. So uh, again, we're doing this weekly. It's a summary of the sort of news and articles and events that we see on our radar. And uh, if you guys have any feedback at all, feel free to let us know on our channel and uh, send us a comment, whether you like the format, whether you hate the format, it's all good. And uh, any parting words from you there, Jim, before we wrap things up? No, this is great. I had a blast. Awesome. Well, thanks Can't a lot. Really week. appreciate it. Yeah. And we'll see you guys on the next one. Take care.